gathering, and we've used it to, to some extent, but not. Mm -hmm. Good to go. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this, uh, this session in the Energy uh, Week in IAP 2009. I'm John Sturman. I'm moderating the panel today. And before we get started and I introduce our distinguished uh, panelists, I want to thank Amanda Graham, Jason Jay, and all the others uh, who have helped to organize not only this session, but all the events this week in, in Energy Week. Uh, I'm going to moderate, and so I'm going to be very brief because we have three distinguished experts on energy efficiency. But let me frame the, uh, the issue a little bit and then introduce them. Most people still today, when they think about energy, think about the problem as how do we get more of it? More production and whichever flavor of energy, drill baby drill, or more nuclear, or solar and other renewables, whatever flavor of energy you prefer, many people still frame the issue as we need more. And I'm sure we need some more. Uh, but what's often lost is that the largest and cheapest source of energy is megawatts, is efficiency. It's been over 30 years since Amory Lovins and others first introduced the concept of megawatts. And there's been an awful lot of progress in both identifying the opportunities for efficiency investments that are cost effective and in developing the information technology, the other technologies, and the understanding of organizations and markets that allow those opportunities to be realized. What you're going to hear about today are some of the exciting developments in both current technology, what you can do right now today, as well as what's coming along in the development labs here at MIT and elsewhere that allow us to reduce the uh, intensity of our uh, energy use in terms of either per capita or per dollar of real GDP, and to do so in a way that's cost effective. Indeed, when you look at it, you'll find that in many cases, it's not only the cheapest way to provide the energy services that we desire, but often can be done profitably. That is, it puts money in your pocket right now today to make these efficiency investments. Most people find that very surprising, but in fact, uh, anything that exists is possible, and we're doing it all the time, including here on the campus. So with that framing, let me introduce our, our panelists. Um, first, we have Harvey Michaels, who's uh, currently a lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, as well as a research scientist with uh, MITEI, the Energy Initiative. Uh, but he's uniquely positioned to introduce this theme because he's worked both as an advisor to governments on how to develop efficiency programs, including in the Massachusetts state government. Uh, he regularly advises policy leaders, uh, utility executives, venture capitalists, and others on how to make this uh, happen, how to make it effective as a business strategy, not just a public policy. Um, and he's been a successful entrepreneur in this area. Uh, having developed uh, at least two companies that successfully uh, work in this space. Uh, I'm going to let him describe the rest of, that, of his background and, and what he's done, and I think you're in, in for a treat on that. Our, our second speaker is Nick Gieski. Nick's a doctoral candidate in the Building Technology Program in our School of Architecture, and he's going to talk about some exciting developments uh, in what you can do in greenfield operations. So, for example, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi uh, and Mazdar, the zero energy city that's uh, zero net energy city, net carbon city that's coming up. Uh, what can you do if you've got a clean slate and have the opportunity to introduce entirely new infrastructure and technology? Uh, some of you may have seen the article that was on the front page of the New York Times yesterday, exactly on Mazdar, exactly on this theme, talking about MIT's collaboration with them and the opportunities there. And we're going to hear something about that, as well as what's going on here in the Media Lab to develop those technologies for deployment uh, in brownfield settings, where you've got an existing infrastructure. Our uh, final speaker is Walt Henry, who's currently the director of the engineering division in the Department of Facilities here at MIT. I've had the opportunity to work with Walt a little bit uh, uh, since we're both members of what we call the Walk the Talk Task Force, which is the institute-wide group charged with greening up the campus in all ways, uh, but including our energy use and our carbon footprint. Uh, Walt has long experience in this, in this domain, and he's one of the leaders here on campus in bringing to bear what we have today, 
off the shelf, ready to go technologies that can be deployed right now and make a substantial difference in our energy use and our carbon footprint. And be sure to ask him if he doesn't tell you about steam traps. With that, uh, let me hand it over to Harvey. And just uh, format wise, we'll have uh, the presentations, a few minutes of clarificatory or other questions immediately after each speaker, uh, and then about 25, 30 minutes for open discussion after all three. Harvey, thank you. Is uh, this working? Live Hello? Am I all set? Good, thanks. Well, I've really enjoyed my time back at MIT since September. I left. Uh, uh, after having a couple degrees in 75. And uh, there's a lot of interesting parallels between now and 75. And I didn't actually intend when I, when I was graduating with my civil engineering and, and urban planning degrees to uh, make a career in efficiency. But the economy was sort of like it is now. And it happened to be the place where I could find a good job. I was working in the governor's office on that. And uh, I said, well, this will be interesting for a couple of years. Uh, the first time I, I looked to pull out of that, uh, this fellow Walt Henry gave me a job at a startup called Zenergy. Uh, and uh, uh, over the many years, Walt can add to this, uh, we uh, did a number of things developing ESCO and energy services businesses, as well as really the planning arm behind the Amory Levins hypothesis, uh, where we had actually generated the studies that resulted in plant cancellations in exchange for efficiency programs run by utilities. Uh, then there was 10 years where, going back with some other MIT alumni, uh, we developed a software business uh, that uh, did the dot-com thing. Uh, it's referenced in Inconvenient Truth. Uh, and uh, also developed the operating system for smart grid systems that uh, are now uh, getting pretty widespread that I'm going to mention. Uh, and then I had the wonderful opportunity to come back. Uh, we. Uh, we had a class in the fall called Enabling an Energy Efficient Society. Uh, and the challenge in that class was for us to find the amount of resource that we could create, putting this equivalence that Negawatt suggests between efficiency and other resources, and see if we could quantify it and understand the basis for how much efficiency there was and whether or not it actually could push off uh, the necessity for some other forms of energy uh, outer continental shelf drilling, ANWR, certain kinds of power plants. Uh, and that really was the hypothesis. And I think the class did very well in developing forward-looking approaches to get this done. The key aspect when I'm talking about energy efficiency is that I'm talking about the opportunity to get the same amount of productive end use in lighting, heating, comfort with less input which is very different than conservation, which is about choosing to have less light, less comfort, which is a fair consideration with the challenges we're facing. But that's not how I'm defining efficiency. When we look at efficiency as a resource strategy, what we're seeing is what specific actions can we do that if we do those actions, we'll get an incremental change in the amount of energy that will be needed over the long term that we can quantify and displace the need for other resources. And the real question is, if we can dimension these strategies, how do they stack up? If we can actually put the same kind of, of dimensions around a policy of tighter standards or installation or rebates of high efficiency equipment and compare the amount of energy impact we have with building a new generating station. How do they compare? And not only from the standpoint of economics, but, uh, but greenhouse gases, et cetera. You know, America since 1980 has not really been the leader in all of this. Uh, this uh, the, the red is the, is the, uh, the all the countries that have, uh, have signed but not ratified the Kyoto Treaty. Uh, and that really is, uh, you know, there's nothing more American than using a lot of cheap energy. And uh, that's really, from a policy standpoint, what we've been about. As an oil importing nation, we have the lowest taxes on gasoline of any other nation. We uh, developed standards in the 70s for automobiles that we then relaxed, have recently tightened up again. 
uh, we, uh, we let SUVs off the hook, counting them as trucks, uh, and did really all we could to not lead from the standpoint of efficiency or green. And now the question is, where has that brought us? Uh, and this is something that, that this group and uh, this week we've talked about a lot. We have almost definitely, at this point, an irreconcilable supply-demand model on energy. We cannot have a healthy economy and low energy prices at the same time. Uh, we might be wrong about that. There may be a substantial increase in supply that MIT can create quickly through other resources. But the interesting thing is if you look at the years from 2004 to 2008 and that dramatic price run up, that was the first time that didn't happen as a result of a supply disruption. It was the first time prices just took off on their own from the standpoint of demand outstripping supply. So as big as a problem as the energy, uh, as the economic side of energy is, now let's look at the environmental side. You know, all indications are we are right now at this point, at this moment, at the point where if we don't do something substantial from the standpoint of greenhouse gases, we are going to have an unmanageable, irreversible climate change. The International Government, uh, Governmental Council on Climate Change uh, in the UN has studied this a number of times. Uh, the uh, chairman of the IPCC in 2008 said, what we do in the next three years will determine our future. This is our defining moment. So it's a big deal. It's something that I'm passionate about, and I appreciate that many of, of you are as well. So now I'm going to drill down and talk about technology, as I was asked to do. Uh, and the one area, just one of the many areas that you can look at, is energy in homes and buildings. Uh, and we look at U.S. rather than looking at the entire world. And if we look at energy use in homes and buildings, we're actually looking at a significant amount of energy, 71% of all the electricity and almost 50% and over 50% of all the gas is used by buildings in this country. And the indications are from what's been done in companies like the one that Walt and I belong to and the work that continues and the research that has been done and the many things that have gone on that almost definitely we can save over 50% of all of that energy cost effectively. That is, if you put the right economics behind it, it costs you less to run a building with 50% of the energy use than it does with the energy use they would have otherwise. And this counts a lot. The, some of the things we're talking about, if we just tuned up all the home central air conditioning systems around the United States for a couple hundred bucks, got the refrigerant level right, sealed the leaks in the ducts, by, that, by itself, that would displace the need for 26,000 megawatt power plants, very cost effectively to the customers. There are lots of compact fluorescents out there, but in these kind of fixtures, these recessed cans, which have propagated throughout the building stock, there are very few compact fluorescents. Right there, we can knock 5% off our total load, and that's before we figure out LEDs that will knock more off. And the item I'm going to talk more about is modulation. If we can more intelligently modulate the way we use energy so that the light and comfort follows you around and is where you need it, and it's not where you're not. By itself, that seems to have the potential of saving a quarter or more of all the other energy that we use, which to me, that's a really interesting MIT focal point. How do we get this done? Uh, there's a lot to be discussed in deployment methods. One of them deals with smart grid, a big topic that uh, is uh, is being discussed as being a key item in the stimulus package. Uh, rebates and direct install programs funded by utilities, which, have, which are now big in Massachusetts and in many other states, that have the potential to do a great deal. And actually raising the bar for the first time in decades in a significant way on appliances and on building standards so that rather than being the least common denominator, this really low bar that you, know, you can kind of step over, it's actually a high bar that we have to innovate to reach, like when the challenge was made to go to the moon in the 70s. There's a lot more that we can do, and one of the ways to do it is to actually set a long-term standard to get there. 
So in a couple minutes, I'm just going to put one category that I find interesting that uh, is going on a lot in MIT on the table. And uh, there are a lot of names for it. It's associated with smart grid, but it's really the customer side of the smart grid rather than the things dealing with the distribution system, which are also important. Uh, it's dealing with... <laughs> yeah, well, I was just wondering if that was my phone. <laughs> oh, well. Um, it's the things dealing with what happens inside homes and businesses. The, the customer side of smart grid has the potential of being what really makes the whole smart grid system go because that's really where all the value is. And it's some combination of a utility network going to home controls that modulates energy as we talked about. The necessary part of it is to have meters that uh, can measure time on, a, uh, uh, on an interval basis rather than once a month when a meter meter comes by and put prices that vary depending on uh, the time of day and the season, but also having critical peak days which have much higher prices uh, which is really the, the hours that we have to build the systems on. Data has shown, though, that prices by themselves, while they may save 4% with a time of use rate or 12% with a critical peak rate, that when you actually add controls and information, you're looking at much bigger impacts. So a key part of smart grid working is having those right sets of controls working around the information and the pricing to make something happen. Uh, I won't carry all the way through this, but there are interesting researchable questions and business opportunities all over this picture. There's the consumer side where they have a router connected to all sorts of devices that has an internet con connection on these devices that's ready to respond to interest the consumer may have. There's a meter that somehow has to get uh, revenue information back to the utility. Maybe it goes through the home router. And then there's things on the utility side where they manage information and they handshake with the device systems. And it gets really, really interesting. Uh, around MIT right now, uh, we can come back into this in some of the Q&A, there are at least half a dozen related projects to responsive energy going on. And this seems to be a place that uh, MIT is interested in and very easily could excel. So putting a little bit of a picture around this, what does it mean? What does it mean in the, meal, in, the, in the near term? There's some kind of web application, maybe downloadable to your cell phone, that's provided by Google or the, or the uh, uh, thermostat manufacturer or your water heater. And basically, you talk to your computer or your cell phone and say generally what you would like it to do. And then it does something which is a step function better than the way things are done now. You can say, be smarter. How s be smarter? OK, I have some default characteristics for smarter. We can walk around the house and say, gee, I wonder how much all these, uh, these lights cost to run. The phone says, turn them on. You turn them on, it takes a read off the meter. It says, here's how much it costs to run those lights during this period of time. There can be lots of rate structures. And you can say to your phone, Pick me the best rate structure. And it'll analyze them all out, come up with the one that actually is the best fit with you. You can put a theme saying, I want to be really, really green. And it'll say, all right, this is how your house is going to run. And you look at that and say, ooh, I don't know if I want to be quite that green. And then you can find something that is the right profile for you. And then you can actually sell load back to the utility. The utility may say, I'll pay you $10 a month uh, if you'll let me turn the water heater off when I need to turn it off. Press 3 on your cell phone if that's what you want. And so there are these kind of transactions that can go on. And you know this is not hard for anybody here, but it's a wide open marketplace. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity. So I think it's time for America, and certainly MIT is in a place to lead America in this point, to be the leaders to develop greater energy efficiency through all the solutions of technology, and policy and business models that are there in order to make something happen to it. It really ought to be not only something we do because we're environmentally conscious. It's a real important strategic opportunity for us as individuals and also for the nation as a whole. As it was put, green is not simply a new form of electric power, taking the megawatt model. It's a new form of generating national power.
it's a thing that can bring America back to the forefront rather than being in the back of this right now. I just read Tom Friedman's book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, and I recommend it. Uh, it was a great articulation. I knew all that stuff, but I really liked the way he said a lot of things. And one of the things that he put together that rang true for me, and I think it would ring true for a lot of us at MIT, is that we need to get back to work on our country and our planet. The hour is late. The stakes couldn't be higher. The project couldn't be harder. The payoff couldn't be greater. And with that, I hope I leave you enthused to do something with energy efficiency. Terrific. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, if there's, <coughs> excuse me, if there's one or, or two quick clarificatory questions, uh, then we'll move on. Go ahead, sir. This isn't uh, really clar uh, clarificatory. Um, is there anyone in MIT and one of the other disciplines who's looking at how much value there is in terms of the amount of energy efficiency that would result if we could put in in-bill financing that would be transparent and automatic? So that people could invest, make investments and improvements and see a net savings in their next bill without having to go to the bank, without having to expense the energy efficiency instead of financing it the way the utility rebates are going. There is some. Certainly, as, as what was going on within the Department of Urban Studies and Planning and, and the class that I was involved in, we're assessing those kind of changes in structures. There's also the behavioral lab that Kent Larson is running that's really looking at how people actually change the way they do things when you give them different information stimulus to do it. So both of those fit directly in, in that category, I think. Sure. Yeah. Could you give a quick interview of the structure of um, enterprises and agencies that are trying to do this now? Oh, that would take hours. Uh, quick overview of the agencies and enterprises that are in this space. What's the organizational landscape look like? We have f f a few footnotes just for Massachusetts. All right, so now you can extrapolate by all the states and all the nations uh, in the world. Uh, we passed legislation last summer requiring utilities as an enabling agency to spend uh, two to four times as much money as they have been spending to make sure that all cost-effective efficiency was accomplished by their customers, which include <laughs> most of us and include the university. At the same time, money is collected through utility bills for the Renewable Energy Trust, which is uh, available for both efficiency as well as, as well as renewable resources in Massachusetts. Uh, and there are a number of uh, uh, lobbying and community organizations that are working with this uh, such as the Clean Energy Council, which is made up of the suppliers and technologists and those kind of folks uh, that are wanting to make sure that Massachusetts moves in that direction. So between those, I think there's a lot of momentum in this state, and a number of other states have similar, sometimes differently dimensioned, but same objective approaches. Uh, and then you have the whole federal level. There's lots more questions. I'm going to ask you all to hold those for the general discussion. And thank you very much, Harvey. We're going to now move on to, uh, to Nick, who's going to talk about uh, what's going on in the, uh, in the Gulf states and here in the Media Lab. So hello. Um, I am Nick Gajewski. I am a doctoral candidate in building technology. We're sort of the engineering brother to the Department of Architecture. And we have a lot of students in mechanical and civil engineering working there as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, innovations for campuses, both in terms of technology and what to do with data. Um, some things that are uh, in the works for MASDAR, which I'll talk about, uh, development in Abu Dhabi, and a little bit about some work that's happening right here on campus. Um, to give you some background, uh, I studied physics at Cornell. I don't have nearly the length of background as these two. Um, but while I was there, I got involved with a number of efforts to try to make uh, Cornell's campus much more efficient. Um, we, uh, we had a group, Kyoto was a very hot topic at the time, and we uh, got the university to sign on to uh, essentially the Kyoto Protocol for the university as a way to demonstrate uh, leadership uh, at the university level for the country. Um, unfortunately, from uh, Harvey's map, you can see it, it's not working yet, uh, but maybe soon. Um, 
I then went and worked in environmental policy for a few years uh, down in DC, a group called the Environmental Law Institute, um, and worked on a number of issues relating to sta sustainability from water quality to um, comparing uh, cap and trade uh, with best available control technology type um, interventions. And have since come back to MIT, back to sort of my true uh, passion, which is uh, building energy efficiency and, and addressing climate change through efficiency. Um, so, uh, quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, the first uh, topic will be Mazdar, which is a university and a city um, in Abu Dhabi, just outside of Abu Dhabi. Um, their goal is to be uh, at least near zero carbon, uh, or, or maybe zero carbon. Um, we are doing some research here at uh, MIT related to uh, some technologies they may or may not implement over at Mazdar, having to do with uh, low lift efficient cooling technologies. I have to acknowledge uh, one of my advisors who's sitting right here and a professor at Mazdar, Peter Armstrong. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about uh, some energy efficiency research here at MIT. Um, Steven Samuhos, who was going to be the speaker today and couldn't make it, uh, is working with the Media Lab on um, intelligent infrastructure for energy efficiency, which Harvey mentioned, um, having to do with uh, some new networking technologies that may make it easier to monitor and perhaps control uh, energy consumption in buildings. And I'll also talk about some efforts um, briefly, because I think Walt will touch on them, to uh, get more access to data from bu campus buildings and uh, analyze that to provide feedback to the community, to the facilities, um, through analysis and uh, visualization. So first, Mazdar. Um, there's a, a rendering of what Mazdar City is meant to look like. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's uh, designed to be a near zero carbon footprint campus. Um, I'll point out on the uh, next slide a, a big solar array. And there's plans for photovoltaic panels on many of the buildings. Um, unfortunately. Uh, you can see them on the buildings in the next rendering as well. Unfortunately, it's, it was pretty clear, I think, to them, I'm guessing early on, that um, you can't do it with supply side alone. You need to reduce the energy consumption of the city and the campus in order to meet those needs um, with, uh, in a near, carbon, near zero carbon way uh, with renewable energy. So um, some research that's, that I'm working on with Peter and with Les Norford and the Building Technology Group uh, is on low lift cooling technologies. Uh, we're working to demonstrate a novel approach to, uh, to cooling systems. Um, the goal ultimately would be to integrate some of this into the Mazdar development and reduce uh, energy demand. Um, one of the key points I want to make is that it's really a combination of a whole set of technologies that aren't necessarily individually new technologies, but it's, it's more the uh, the effective integration and the innovative integration of all these technologies together that can drastically reduce uh, energy consumption for cooling. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, namely, those technologies listed here, variable speed chillers, uh, radiant cooling, uh, energy storage. So you may have ice tanks, or it may be passive storage within the building envelope. Um, uh, more monitoring. Uh, system identification just means learning how the building responds to different drivers, like solar energy, temperature fluctuations outside, occupants. Um, and finally, optimal predictive control of the cooling system based on everything that you know about the building. Um, so quickly, what is low lift? Uh, essentially, what you're doing is reducing the condensing temperature and raising the evaporating temperature so that your work polygon on your vapor compression cycle is shrunk. Um, that way, it, it takes less power to cool the building. Um, you achieve this through radiant cooling. With radiant cooling, you can achieve um, higher evaporating temperatures than, uh, than with, say, an, an air-blown evaporator, an air-side evaporator. Um, load shifting, you can do this both, both with the use of thermal mass um, and also with optimal predictive control, or predictive control at least. Um, that lowers the uh, condensing temperature because you may be operating at night when temperatures are more favorable. Um, based on predictions, you could actually determine when the best times of day it are to operate the uh, cooling system. And finally, um, a chiller performance model, which tells you how much energy the, the chiller will consume um, based on outdoor temperature conditions, indoor temperature conditions, and speeds of different components of the, of the um, cooling system. So um, 
I won't get into details about the graphs because uh, I don't feel this is this kind of talk. Um, so how would this work uh, in a smart building? Um, you would need monitoring and networked uh, information that you can access with a computer. Um, you can then analyze it. Um, you can learn how the building responds. You would also be tracking solar energy outside, temperature, and you'd have weather forecasts telling you what the likely loads are, are going to be on the building. So with this information and with uh, system identification methods, you can learn how the building is responding to all kinds of drivers. Um, and then having some model of how your cooling system performs, um, you know how much energy it will consume given a certain set of conditions, certain loads, and uh, desired conditions for the zones inside the building. Um, so you can monitor all kinds of data coming out of the building and the environment, um, learn how the building is responding based on predictions for the next day, uh, determine the optimal way to control your cooling system, um, and then either store energy in order to load shift or do cooling right then, and you can determine over the whole course of the day the best way to store the energy versus use it uh, in, the, in the building. Um, so here's just some images of our lab. Um, that's a, uh, a heat pump that has a whole lot of sensors on it, and you can't really tell what's going on. Um, that's part of the point. <laughs> um, we're, we're monitoring much more than you normally would inside a building. Um, in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, we're also trying to develop or enhance models of different components of a heat pump system. And this could lead to better understanding of how it's going to perform under different conditions. Ideally, what you'd have is performance, uh, manufacturers providing performance data about, uh, about the cooling system that you could then use to do the optimal control. Um, the other, the picture on the right is actually a test chamber where we have a number of sensors and we're going to do um, system identification on the thermal response of the chamber. And eventually we'll install radiant cooling, uh, maybe PEX tubes um, on the floor uh, underneath a, a whole set of layers of thermal mass. And then we can demonstrate this whole process um, with the hopes that they may incorporate it at Mazdar. So, what does, how much does this really save? And I have to thank Peter for both the analysis and the graphs on this. Um, uh, it depends on the building. <laughs> it depends on the climate. It's not as simple as saying it's going to save this much. But um, if you compare all these, this suite of low lift technologies with standard cooling technologies or HVAC systems like VAV, variable air volume, and you, you simulate them in cities all over the US, do it for different types of buildings, code compliant buildings versus high performance buildings. You can see a whole range of savings. And you can't read the graphs, but the, the, uh, the, the trend is the important part. And on the far left of each of those columns, each, column, each set of columns is a, is a city. And on the far left is a conventional building with a fairly conventional cooling system. And on the right is this suite of uh, low lift cooling technologies applied to these buildings. And you can see, in overall, uh, savings can be as much as 60 to 75 percent for cooling energy in the building. So far greater than sort of 15 or 20 percent than that we hear for lighting upgrades and variable speed drives and other technologies. Um, but that's starting from scratch. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some work that's going on on campus here. Uh, both some research and just some uh, extracurricular activities, really. People have devoted their time to try new things. Um, the first is data mining uh, for, for efficiency. Um, this is really derived from Steven's work, uh, Steven Smuhos. He has uh, uh, a number of sensors installed in N42 and in NW35, two buildings, to provide feedback to occupants uh, about their energy performance in the hopes that uh, knowledge about their, their behaviors and their energy consumption will change the way they use the building. Um, and also in the hopes that it will make the building more comfortable and a better place to be. Um, there are a number of other things you can use it for other than performance feedback. Fault detection and diagnosis is more um, geared towards someone like Walt or uh, others at facilities who need to determine when things are wrong, uh, are going wrong, do something about it before a lot of energy gets wasted. And I, Walt will probably share some examples like steam traps. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the other possibility is you can do retrofit assessments. So um, you can track, and some of this is done already, but you can track how well, uh, how much energy a retrofit has saved. And one of my visions is combining this with uh, models of buildings that have been identified through uh, 
uh, system identification, you could actually predict retrofit savings rather than just track. Um, so the final thing I'll talk about is rethinking building monitoring. Um, I'll come to it. So first, leveraging building data. How, how would this work? Um, I already mentioned the pilot studies. Uh, why don't we look at the, the graph on the right? Um, it's essentially a structure of a typical set of data points inside a building for the control system, um, for the HVAC system. Sometimes it's connected to lights and security and fire protection, various things. So uh, on campus here, there's, there's Pi, and I don't want to say too much if Walt's going to talk about it, which has energy consumption data in it, um, gas, electric, um, water even, uh, sewage, I think. Um, I'm leaving, oh, steam and, and chilled water consumption. Um, and there's also the control systems for the buildings. Uh, TAC and Carrier uh, are the major vendors for MIT. And there are, there's data galore in all those uh, systems. But it, very little of it is being utilized right now. So one of the goals on campus here, and a uh, number of students in the past have, have uh, been pushing Facilities and administration to do this. Walt and Peter Cooper at facilities are, are excited to do this. Um, and many others uh, is to actually get access to that data, have a place to uh, analyze it, do research on it, machine learning methods to do fault detection, um, provide performance feedback to, to the community. Um, I'll quickly show uh, the energy map. This is uh, Steve Peters and Tarek uh, Rashad. They created this out of, system, out of data in the Pi system. Um, it's a map of energy intensity for buildings on campus. Right now, you have watts per square foot for different buildings all over campus. Uh, things that stand out are the really dark red one in the middle. They make uh, semiconductor chips in there, I think. Um, and you can, you can pick and choose uh, different buildings. But you know, sometimes you can see outliers. Um, this is not real-time data, though. This is all data that uh, facilities, out of the goodness of their heart, provided to Steve and, and Tarek to analyze, to post online, the ultimate goal would to be to make all this real time. Um, there's an example. Uh, UC Davis has a, sort of a Google app where you can actually click on their buildings and look at the energy consumption for the last 24 or 48 hours and even look at um, that energy consumption compared to other buildings, if you have two similar buildings, or even compared to historical use. So you can see how this might be um, Inf interesting information just for gen the general public if they work in a building, and certainly very good information for facilities um, to figure out what's going wrong or right with buildings. The last thing I'll talk about is uh, rethinking building monitoring. Um, this relates to, to uh, leveraging data because this may be a way to uh, get easier access to data. Um, this is out of the Media Lab, Neil Gershenfeld's group, Center for Bits and Atoms. Um, Essentially, the, it looks very simple and very, very dumb in a way, but it's actually intelligent. <laughs> the, the light switches and the plugs all have IP addresses. And rather than having a control network that you install in a building and runs back to some central location and you have to go through all these proprietary systems, you can integrate uh, an IP a, a server, a little mini server, I think, into uh, each of these devices and communicate with them directly and be able to query how much energy is being consumed through them, if you added uh, some control functions, you could tell them what to do. Um, so there's great potential here. Um, one of the other potentials in the building industry, if it means less infrastructure, less wiring, and they're integrated into the devices before they're even installed into the building, it makes the whole process uh, a bit easier. How am I doing on time? One Wrap it up. Or so. This is my last slide. <laughs> so um, a few things about getting involved here on campus. Um, there's a pretty strong community that, that ebbs and flows surrounding sustainability and energy efficiency. Um, there are research opportunities. Um, my group in building technology, the Media Lab, Laboratory for electric, uh, Electromagnetic and Electronic Systems, um, and of course the Energy Initiative all can connect you with uh, research opportunities having to do with energy efficiency. Um, on campus, there's sustainability at MIT. Um, which uh, sort of grew out of this generator event where Jason also uh, was instrumental in bringing together. Um, the generator, I believe, is happening again uh, this semester, February 19th. Um, and there's also, uh, I think they're actually called sustainability brigades, not efficiency brigades. Um, but we've already had one group of people walk around a building, um, building 18, I think we were in, to commission the occupancy centers. And we're going to be doing 
I think there will be more of those, um, both to raise awareness and educate people about uh, efficiency and also to, um, to actually do something on campus. So that's it. Uh, thanks. And do I have time? Uh, so we'll take a couple of questions, and then we'll move on to Walt. Go ahead. One of the things on your steamer capture, I was checking out on it, and I believe uh, MIT put in about $260,000 into it. And to date, my understanding is they re got a return of around $775,000. Sorry, this was the steam trap retrofits? Yes. I, I, I'll defer to Walt, because I'm sure he knows better than I do. Program. We've invested in the first two years. I think the first year was, um, <clears throat> forgive me, I don't remember the exact numbers. The investment was probably 350000 bucks. The second year was probably close to the 270 you're talking about. Uh, so it's, we're going to begin the third year in the spring. Uh, so it's about a one-year payback. Uh, Which is very good. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. There's a few other things we have that are one-year paybacks, but that's a significant one. No, that was campus-wide, pretty much. Yeah. The first one was on EAST. Okay. Yeah. So when you do this, so you said it was a one-year payback financially, but as far as from an energy standpoint, to do all this retrofitting and um, to change, to, to add all these IP sources and everything, and to add all the wiring and networks and stuff like that, is, I guess, how much do you need energy usage to decrease to actually have it pay off to go through this whole process? It's um, a good question. So to repeat the question, it's uh, in order to uh, actually make these things worth doing, like installing um, greater monitoring systems or um, retrofits on campus, how much you actually have to save. Um, I think it depends on a case-by-case -case basis, which is why you know, we have people analyzing the cost benefits of doing a retrofit. Um, unfortunately, I think there, there are other barriers that, that uh, prevent retrofits from happening um, more than just potential savings. I think there are, there are, there's a whole list of retrofits that pay back very well. And by payback, that incorporates you know, paying for the whole project um, that aren't, are still not funded. Um, and you know, facilities would like to do them, <laughs> from what I've seen. Um, so I think that, uh, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but there's no shortage of, of retrofit projects that, that do pay back, including um, the cost of doing them. Now, I suppose if you look at the life cycle energy costs, uh, it, would, it would add a new dimension um, to the, the costing. Um, but on the other hand, tearing down a building and building one that's totally new um, versus retrofitting something can often be that much more costly in terms of energy. We're going to move on, but uh, uh, let me just say that the question you're asking is terribly important. And I think when you do the analysis, I'll let the experts speak, the full life cycle impact, including the embodied energy of the devices, their operating costs, and their ultimate disposal and recycling, you still, for retrofits, have the best bang for the buck and return per joule of anything you can do. Great. The most efficient building to have is the one you already own if you don't have to. Yeah. And uh, a slight AV adjustment, and then we'll be off and running with Walt. And, and really, this was a great lead-in for Walt because uh, he's going to tell you about what we're doing right now with currently available technology. Yeah, so uh, not so much about the future, but about, uh, about today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about technology, but I'm also going to talk about strategies because for us, trying to get things done, we can't simply focus on technology. We've got to focus on a plan to implement things. We have to focus on the economics, lots of other things. So we'll talk a little bit about all of those kinds of things. So I'm calling it energy present, really. Where's my? So first of all, we begin, when we think about doing things, we begin with a set of criteria that we want to measure our prospective uh, projects against. And there are many projects, as Nick says. So we have to be selective. So quickest payback, that's obvious, no, <clears throat> no news there. Uh, for us, the largest savings for the minimum, not only capital investment, but for the minimum engineering investment, since uh, we have a limit both of capital and engineering time. So that's an important factor for us. Harvey referred a little bit uh, earlier to utility rebates. 
We're very sensitive, and I'm going to talk about them later. We're very sensitive to the fact that there are a lot of utility rebates available, and we, in many cases, craft the program to take advantage of what's available at that time, not to lose the rebate when something might expire. So that's a pretty significant uh, factor for us as well. I won't read the other criteria, but we're, we're looking for other things, deferred maintenance and helping out our colleagues in facilities operations as well. So one place to start, and Nick uh, was a great lead in, uh, <clears throat> is what data do we have about buildings on the campus? So we, we do have data, not real time, unfortunately, of 156 buildings. We have real time data probably in a, in a dozen. Uh, so we take data monthly from our metering system, which uh, Nick referred to, something called PI, uh, which reads meters that are enabled to be read. Many are not. But we take that, we look at that data, and we look at uh, a metric that many people use, thousands of BTUs per square foot per year. That's energy use all converted back to BTUs. Uh, in Europe, they use kilowatt hours, but it's the same, the same metric. So basically, uh, we look at a campus average here of 243,000 BTUs per square foot per year. But when we start to slice it down, in housing, the average is about 108. I won't get into the rest. So we're looking for outliers here. So we're looking for buildings that are 300 or 400,000 BTUs per square foot per year. So that's the first indicator that we have some opportunity in the building, unless we can explain away the, the higher use. So this kind of data is very important. And the kind of data that Nick is talking about, uh, the Media Lab helping us to gather, is, is uh, more real time and much more valuable than the data we collect on a monthly basis. So when you look at where the energy goes on campus, where in fact, where the energy bills go. Big piece of it, not surprisingly, is electricity. So when we put together a program, the first place we're going to start is to look for electric savings. Uh, that's about half of the energy bill that we pay on campus. Now, the electricity is um, about evenly, where it goes, is about evenly distributed between lighting, something called plug load, and everything plugged in here is plug load today, and drives, which are fans and pumps in buildings. So it's about evenly distributed. So if we take a look at what the factors uh, that impact each of these, it kind of leads us to where we might have the greatest opportunity for the least amount of effort. So if you look at plug load, many widely varied uses, computers, refrigerators, research equipment, uh, many, many different things that use electricity from a plug. So there's no simple solution to reducing plug load because it's so varied and so spread across the campus. There's also a lot of research use that would be hard for us to deal with. Drives, fans and pumps, well, there are fewer of those. But again, every building has a different heating or cooling technology that you would have to tackle to save energy in fans and pumps. Not to say that we shouldn't be doing it, but it's probably not the first place we would go. Lighting, therefore, probably is our biggest opportunity. The lighting systems are the same or similar across most buildings. Probably, if we do it right, we have the least user impact when we improve efficiency in lighting systems. And it's um, an area where, surprisingly, uh, I think to some at least, uh, there have been the greatest advances in technology over perhaps the last five or 10 years. So lots of opportunity in lighting, and I'll spend a few minutes talking about that. So the hierarchy of strategies is first of all to use less of it. So our first step is to look at light levels. Now this room is probably appropriately lit for the task at hand, but many of our rooms are not. They're overlit. Can we reduce the light level? Easy place to start. Doesn't cost a lot of money, generally. Not difficult to do, again, generally. Uh, second thing is, can we reduce the hours of operation? Walk around at night. Uh, some of our students have done that for us, and it's been helpful. Uh, lots of things are still lit after people have gone home. So can we reduce hours of operation? Lots of opportunity there. I'll talk about that later. So the first part of the lighting strategy is to <clears throat> get the usage down before you start investing in new lamps, new ballasts, and new fixtures. Typically, those are more expensive things to invest in. So if we can reduce the hours of operation or reduce the light levels, then the investment that we have to make to save may look quite different. So hours of operation, I won't talk about light levels. That's kind of technical, and it's also very individual. But hours of operation is a big opportunity across the campus, and I'll spend a few slides uh, talking about that. One of the things that we'll be investing in and have done pilot projects on is something called occupancy sensors. 
generally, not always, you don't want the lights on if you don't have people in the space. So after we leave, uh, hopefully somebody, Amanda, will t uh, turn the, uh, where'd Amanda go? Yep. I remember you. We'll turn the lights out uh, in the space, but that doesn't always happen. So an occupancy sensor is a good thing. It knows when we're there. It knows when we're not there. Some of the more sophisticated ones uh, know whether we have daylight in the room, and we can perhaps dim the lighting system so that we're only providing artificial light to the degree that we need. We're taking advantage of the daylight. So occupancy sensors are uh, a big investment for us. I'm not going to get into the technologies. I simply want to show you that there are a number of different types of technologies. We're using all of these because each, each technology is correctly applied in different sets of circumstances. Uh, some of these technologies measure the heat from the human body. You couldn't do that in this room. They don't work in a big room like this. Some of them measure sound. You probably would work in a building like this. Others use a Doppler shift from, which is kind of a radar type of thing. Uh, from uh, radio waves that they send out uh, could also perhaps work in a room like this. So there's a lot of different technologies. Uh, so knowing the technologies and how they get applied is, uh, is part of the trick. Uh, this is just a picture of a wall-mounted sensor, so we're looking down on it. And you can see, and I won't again get into the details, but depending upon what you're trying to achieve in the room, there are different distances from that sensor where different technologies work or don't work. So my staff spends time understanding these technologies, looking at the rooms, deciding what type of technology to deploy. Uh, it isn't, as somebody once said to me, rocket surgery, but it is uh, something you have to pay attention to. That isn't going to work, I guess. We'll just, I'll stick it in my pocket. Does that work? Okay. Uh, so here's an example. Oh. home back there, didn't it? Or you found it. Here's an example of something we're about to begin in Building 66, an occupancy sensor investment. Uh, cost is about $60,000. I mentioned rebates earlier. We'll get an NSTAR rebate of about $10,000 for that investment. So that's a not insignificant uh, rebate for the, for the uh, work that we're going to do. Uh, savings are about $20,000, so the payback's about two and a half years. So if you look across the campus, you see kind of a similar... Um, set of possibilities to deploy occupancy sensors uh, throughout the campus. And I'm talking about classrooms, offices, uh, perhaps in some cases corridors, not always uh, toilet rooms, things like that. So there are, those are the spaces where generally we think this works. You're looking at an over $3 million investment and uh, a $1.2 million payback, so it's, or, or uh, savings, so about a three-year payback. And the, uh, the rebate from the uh, utility uh, measurably alters that payback. So this is a pretty attractive thing for us to do. Not many of the uh, opportunities that we have will look quite this good. Many fall into this range, but uh, many don't. So it's a pretty significant thing, and this is something that we're teeing up and hoping to get uh, money to invest in. Now, after we've controlled the light levels, reduced them, after we've controlled the hours of operation of the lights, it may make sense to take relatively inefficient light sources out and replace them with those that are more efficient. So again, I won't get into the details, but here's kind of the hierarchy of efficiency. Um, the measure, the metric is lumens per watt. The lumen is the amount of light that the lamp or the light source puts out. So the more lumens, the brighter, the fewer lumens, obviously, the darker. Uh, and the watts uh, is the amount of energy that are used. This is essentially miles per gallon in your automobile. So the more miles per gallon you get, the better off you are. The more lumens per watt, the better off you are. So you can see that there's a very significant difference here with our friend incandescent, which we still see a lot of, uh, right at the bottom at 17 lumens per watt. So uh, here, inside, incandescent, halogen, fluorescent, and even metal halide are possibilities uh, for indoor lighting. High-pressure sodium is really outdoor lighting only. It's a very yellow light. But mo uh, much of our outdoor lighting is high-pressure sodium. But I want to focus on two um, technologies that were uh, not available in one case one year ago, and that were not available in the other case two years ago. So LEDs, light emitting diodes, have been around for a long time, but they have not developed to the point that they could be a both reliable and high enough output uh, light source. And a year and a half ago, we looked at LEDs and thought, this is interesting. We'll have to keep our eye on this technology. There'll be an opportunity for us to deploy it at some point. A year later, we were looking at it saying, we need to do this. 
So the rate of change, I referred to this earlier, the rate of change in, in lighting technology has been very, very dramatic. Lots more to come. Uh, less than a year ago, the induction lamp, and I'll show you pictures of these, but I'm not going to get into uh, details. Uh, the induction lamp wasn't even available. We didn't even know about it. The induction lamp is available now. It's in, in, in limited, uh, limited availability and limited configurations. But within another year, there's going to be hundreds, probably, of different opportunities for induction type lighting. Notice two things that are very important here, not in an energy sense, but uh, in, a, in a maintenance sense. That induction lamp has a projected life of 100,000 hours. Uh, none of us will be around at the end of 100,000 hours. Um, the LED, 50,000 hours, although some that we just installed a year ago in the dome have failed and were... <laughs> There's always a distribution. Well, it was, it was a, uh, I can tell you the details. You probably want to know it. Uh, but look at, look at our friend, the incandescent, 750 hours. Uh, so, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of incandescent uh, lighting around on campus. We don't allow it in new buildings anymore, but a building as recent as the Stata Center does have a lot of incandescent lighting in it, regrettably. So we're going back now and formulating a project to replace that. So, uh, just a couple of examples. Um, if you have track lighting at home or, or uh, around here, it's very likely something called an MR lamp. Uh, that is essentially an incandescent. Uh, so we have an LED replacement, and look, the 20-watt MR lamp can re be replaced by a 5.5-watt LED. But here's the big item, 2,500-hour life, 50,000-hour life. So in many cases, it's worth doing this just on the basis of the lamp life, even if there weren't energy savings. If you look at, I mentioned Stata, incandescent lighting in Stata, some of that we have to get a lift to get up to. I'm talking about a lift that you see in a construction site. And some of the lighting in there, we have to put staging in to get to because it's so high up, the lift can't get to it. So, and that stuff has a life of 750 or 1,000 hours. They're replacing that five or six times a year. So if we can take that out of commission and put in something that's a 50,000-hour uh, lamp, then we've saved energy, but we've saved a lot of labor, too. That's what I meant about being aware of other opportunities where we can do something that has multiple benefits to the Institute. That's just a picture of that MR lamp. This is the induction lamp, which uh, is, uh, you really can't see. <laughs> Looks like a big incandescent. Uh, that's, uh, we're looking for a few opportunities to deploy those now. We'll just skip by these examples. None of those came out very well. Um, so if we look at a little more sophistication, uh, I mentioned earlier daylight dimming. Well, a lot of, obviously doesn't apply in a room like this, but a lot of our exterior spaces are well lit by daylight from the windows. And right now, we have no way to match the light we need from daylight and from the artificial lighting system. We can't control the artificial lighting system to that degree. I'm uh, pleased to say, though, that we're doing that in the Sloan project right down the street. And we just got approval to implement that strategy on the Koch Institute as well. And what that will enable us to do is to control all the exterior lighting in the building, that within about 15 feet of the wall, when you get inside that 15 or uh, beyond that 15 foot level, the daylighting is not that, doesn't have that much of an impact. But what, that, what those, that strategy in both of those buildings will do is to allow us to achieve effective light, uh, lighting power densities in those buildings that we've never been able to do in others. A typical building today by code can't exceed on the average across the building one and a half watts a square foot of lighting power. Many of our buildings exceed that. They're two watts or more. If we do a good job with conventional techniques, we might get that to 1.1, 1.2 watts a square foot while well, using the daylight dimming and some other things. Both uh, the Sloan and the, and the uh, Koch Institute will probably commit at 0.8 watts a square foot. So that is half of what a normal building, even if the, just if the normal building is well done, that lighting power density is half of what a normal building would do. So when I said there were significant opportunities in lighting, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. There are opportunities to make dramatic differences. We can't do that so easily with other, other uh, technologies. We did uh, have a big effort some years ago, about eight or 10 years ago, to reduce water use. And we reduced water use on campus by 60%. Uh, but it's unlikely that we could achieve levels like that or numbers like that in other areas. Um, let's skip by that. So I mentioned plug loads. Uh, I want to talk about this for a minute because we've had a lot of very significant student help on this. Uh, I mentioned plug loads earlier and said that we're not generally attacking that right now because it's so varied and so difficult to do. Uh, one exception um, 
that's worth talking about. Vending machines on campus, um, many of them run all the time, 8,760 hours. Uh, the average one is around 400 uh, watts per machine, not a big number, but when you multiply that by, I think, uh, I should have checked the number, it's two or 300 vending machines on campus. Uh, still, it's not a big number, but it's easy to tackle. So what we're doing is we're putting something in called a vending miser, and we have student help to do this. The vending miser is an occupancy sensor that knows whether there's somebody in front of the vending machine or not. It's connected to something that the vending machine gets plugged into, and if that occupancy sensor doesn't see somebody there for a predetermined period of time, we can set that, it shuts the machine down. Now, it does allow it to, uh, to run at a minimum level so that your ice cream doesn't melt or your Coke doesn't get too warm, uh, but for nights and weekends, in many cases, these machines will be off for a very substantial amount of time and um, they wouldn't have been in the past. And we have student help to implement some of these things. So I'm getting the high sign from John. Uh, just let me see. Uh, I had to talk, I had to talk about steam traps. Yeah. So that's what yeah. you were doing, is telling me to talk about well, steam traps. Well, and then we should right. open it up for general discussion. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, just, just one, uh, since I'm required by law now to talk, and by John, to talk about steam traps, I will. Uh, I'm not going to even tell you what a steam trap is. It's an integral. Most of our buildings are heated by steam. It's an integral part of the, the uh, steam system, and they have a life. They break after about five years. They fail. When they fail, they fail open. They leak steam out into the uh, return system and uh, waste a lot of energy. So to prove uh, to, s to some people that uh, investing in steam traps was a good thing to do, uh, we did two dorm buildings. 64 and 62 are, are the oldest, two oldest dorms on campus. They're the, known as the parallel dorms right down the street. Uh, they're as identical as we can get, uh, as the buildings can be. Uh, so we did the steam traps on one, on uh, 62, and we didn't do them on 64. So you can see this is a plot, this red is a plot of outside air temperature. Well, what you would expect in a heating situation is that the steam use would mirror the outside air. So as the outside air falls, the steam use goes up. That's exactly what happens. You can see those two things track very nicely. Uh, the dorm where we didn't do the steam traps uh, was, its use was totally independent of the outside air temperature. So that um, took a year to gather the data, but uh, we have now uh, got, I think, universal acceptance of the idea that steam traps are worth uh, maintaining. So with that, uh, I will. Thank you, Walt. So we'll take a couple questions for Walt and then open it up for general discussion. Uh, let me just point out on the steam trap data that not only after you clean them uh, do you get lower average energy use, but the building is more comfortable because, in fact, it's responding to the outside temperature, whereas in the other building, you're wasting a lot of energy and people have to throw open the windows on a warm afternoon because the heat just keeps coming. So quick questions for Walt. Yep, Yoast. different things come from. It seems like paying an electricity bill is one category. Doing this investment in a retrofit that has a multi-year payback is another category. Does MIT see those as, as equally tradable things, or is one a lot easier to do than the other? That's a very good question. Uh, they, the buckets Stop. are different. There's a, what, what's called a commodity budget, which pays for the gas, the electricity, uh, fuel oil, things like that. That's in one department, not mine. There's uh, then the energy conservation budget, which uh, most of which is mine to uh, deploy. Uh, what we finally, I think, have created is an understanding that if we successfully spend money in the energy conservation area, we decrement the utility budget, and then that decrement should be made available to us for reinvestment. So we've, we've been making that argument for a number of years, and I think uh, we this year have, or last year, have succeeded in getting people to say, yeah, that makes some sense. There's some accounting issues. You know, how do you do that? But those aren't uh, unsolvable issues. So I think we're finally at a point where that concept is accepted and we can finally begin to implement things on that basis. Yeah, go uh, ahead, please. Uh, a little more advanced than it actually is at MIT. But uh, my understanding is in line transmissions, we lose about 20, 25% through heat in transmitting electricity? It depends how far and what has there, has voltage. Any advances in superconducting for that? Harvey, do you want to tackle that? I don't know a lot about it. I know there are. There are some as part of the smart grid deals with superconductors and also more intelligent uh, upstream 
systems, but it, it's not really an area yeah, that I know me, a lot about. Let me the number, I think, is the actual number, I think, is very much smaller than T and the D losses, no, yeah. number you're quoting. I thought it was, I thought it was 20% loss. No, so I don't think so. Okay. Okay. But, but let me make a general comment about this. T, the, so the overall question was about transmission distribution losses in sending electricity over long distances. And regardless of what the actual number is, it's a non-trivial amount of, of energy. And people are doing research in technical fixes for that, like uh, close to room temperature superconducting, uh, superconducting uh, uh, wires, et cetera. But I, I think what's really needed here is a real revolution in how we think about uh, where we get our electricity. If you just think about thermal power plants, two-thirds of all the gross energy input is lost as waste heat. Most of those power plants are far from any load centers, so it's not practical to capture that waste heat. If we had distributed local generation, First of all, it could be much more efficient. Secondly, you could capture that waste heat, use it in CHP applications, use it for uh, district heating, and get up to the 80, 90, or even higher percent total primary efficiency. That's going to outweigh anything you can do with high-tech conductors. Okay. Um, now, I know Trinity Church down at Copley Square had some geothermal wells yeah. given. Yeah, ground source. And it's for heating and cooling. Right. Uh, are these efficient? Do they help? Uh, anybody want to comment on ground source heat pump, geothermal? They're used on campuses and, and other um, places where um, there isn't a combined heat and power central distribution system. But we do have uh, a cogen plant, a combined heat and power plant, whose uh, waste heat is used to make either steam for heating or process or steam that makes our chilled water in the summer. So for institutions who have th that load balance as we have, not all do, that a combined heat and power plant is by far the best, uh, the best answer. That's about 80% efficient. Um, the heat pumps um, might work for us in places that are off of our grid. But uh, in general, where we have electricity and chill water or steam available from that combined heat and power plant, they're not a good idea. Yeah, what about wind and solar? Are they, um, because I think, uh, is it T. Boone Pickens? has put in, I think he's invested um, $2 billion in wind turbines. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he has and has it to invest. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, we did, uh, with some student help, uh, we did a survey of the campus to determine opportunities for wind and found that it was very, very limited. Um, I think all of us expected a different answer, but the, but the result was that there, there weren't great opportunities. Energy did an inventory of wind in this country, and I think there are three states they said that, that potentially could supply all the wind that we would need for electricity. So, yeah. We've got some expertise in the room on wind power. Where Steve Connors, where is he? Uh, so you may want to comment, but uh, wind is uh, already cost effective in many places right now today. The technology has improved dramatically. Denmark gets about 20% of its total electricity from wind right now, and it's still growing. Uh, and the cost curve is still falling. Solar is not quite as cheap, but it's got a 20% learning curve, and it's growing at 30 to 40% a year. So its costs are falling very substantially. There's no question that already today it's cost effective in many places and will be more and more over time. Uh, but where the wind is and where the loads are is not always the same, but that's what we have a, a grid for. Uh, the, the more tricky issue is uh, the intermittency of those uh, renewable sources. Uh, but that simply creates an opportunity for complementary resources, such as uh, cheap storage in the form of, for example, plug-in hybrid vehicles, which you might deploy for their value in transportation, and also get the benefit then of not having to build extra pump storage or other storage for the intermittent electrical sources. Here at MIT is a, uh, is not a way to actually store solar energy. There's a variety of ways to do that. Um, uh, it's a little bit off the efficiency target, but it's a great question. Steve, did you want to make a quick comment well, I mean, on, uh, 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 on On electricity storage, how you normally do it is turn it into a different kind of energy. Okay. And, so, and so the solar one you're talking about is, is can you find a cheap way to turn that okay. into hydrogen? 
and hydrogen is, is nice, at least technologically, because I can turn it easily back into electricity yeah. at relatively good efficiencies, or I can burn it or, or, uh, in, a, in an engine or our house for heat. So I can get a, okay. I can get a thermal fuel and, uh, by converting it back out. And there's lots of different ways to do that. The problem is whenever you add processing steps, yeah. whether it's going from a, a, a coal to electricity to hydrogen, or corn to sour mash to, yeah. to biofuel, there's lots of extra processing steps, and you get uh, efficiency losses uh, uh, much bigger than the TD losses you brought up earlier. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, our understanding is uh, biofuel is really not a good way to go. So you can't generalize any of this stuff, and I think that's the stuff we keep saying is what you've heard for energy efficiency yeah. here is the more you know about the usage yeah. pattern, the more you can target and therefore cost effectively reduce okay. uh, that. For the biofuel stuff, most of the debate has been on the technology. It's not been on where and when do you get really cheap or really good biomass resources to convert, just like you might have a great wind turbine. If you put it where it's not windy, it's not going to do you much good. Okay. Well, so, I think that'll be one of the ways. I think we have other large. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So, Jason, go ahead, please. So, one of the things that sort of strikes me about all these technologies is that they have upfront cost and then payback. And um, the, I mean, and, and payback, the, 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 the term payback even is, is a little bit misleading because even after those three years, you're still getting a revenue stream from it. Um, but um, so, so a lot of these require some upfront financing. And I'm just wondering, what are the best financing mechanisms for us here on campus, for places like Mazdar, for building construction projects and and that are really going to drive an explosion in this industry, because it seems to me like you know some of some of what we're depending on is is rebates, which are basically sort of regulatory driven giveaways. But there's also just financing and you know lower maybe lower interest financing. I'm just wondering, are there in, other innovations that are happening around those areas, and and particularly for our campus, you know, we uh, to answer the Yost question was well, we can plow back the savings into you know, in, into new, new investments so that kind of gets the engine going, but you still need something to kickstart the engine. So where do we get them? Where does the capital come from? Well, uh, first, I would start with the perspective. The thing that you can take with the resource approach is you can look at the cost per kilowatt hour that you're getting through an efficiency measure as compared with buying a kilowatt hour or the cost equivalent to buying natural gas. And the bottom line is for that 50% that on average we can save in all the buildings in the country, <coughs> as well as tens of millions of dollars of projects at MIT, that cost is lower than the cost when the net present value of buying it from the utility today. So it's what we should do. <coughs> Finding the right way to break the hurdles in the model is something that hopefully will have some business innovation. There are energy service companies that will take that you know, off balance sheet to do it and guarantee the savings. Uh, or you can just choose to look at it differently rather than looking at it as a capital cost. It's like your cell phone will cost you $100 a month if you buy it on a monthly basis, $50 a month if you buy it on a two-year contract. The CFLs can be like the two-year contract. Say, all right, you can buy it that way, it's half as much, and make it a non-capital decision. But there's a lot of innovation that hopefully this room will help with. Just a little further to Jason's question, uh, I, and Jason, I think, knows this, but uh, we're pretty well tapped out here in our ability to generate steam for the campus, chill water for the campus, and electricity for the campus. So we're looking at making significant investments in new, and we are right now making investments in new chill water capacity, but we have to do the same thing in the future for steam and electricity. So uh, to pick up on John's comment uh, at the opening, uh, we're trying now to sell this concept of megawatts where it's cheaper to invest in conservation and get a 20% or 25% reduction, gaining some capacity and postponing the need to make major investments in generation capacity. And I think there's a, a greater willingness to understand that concept now than there perhaps ha has been. Uh, so this question is mostly directed at Walton Harvey. Um, so. Within this, uh, the diagram that, that I think Harvey showed at the beginning of this kind of utility network, E-meter, Zigbee home area network, there's a whole lot of different uh, technologies that go into that value chain. And from, from a business standpoint, one of the things I keep struggling with is how can a business position itself along that value chain? Where does it need to be? Where shouldn't it be? 
Um, and ha so how integrated does it need to be? So for example, does the meter company need to be uh, writing the software as well for the Zigbee network? Uh, do they need to integrate all the way down to the home area display, uh, to the display in the room and communicate it in front of the customer? What's the best business model uh, for actually uh, getting these savings into, into the home specifically? And then as a, as a corollary to that, how can you then communicate that value to utilities, which we all know regular utilities tend to be very, very slow moving and risk averse and need to see like very long demonstration periods for, before they partner. So if you could address that. Well, I, I think I'm gonna have to leave it at, it's a very big and a very current topic. Uh, there, there are huge decisions in this realm that are being made right now. As part of this legislation I talked about in Massachusetts last summer was the requirement that utilities do smart grid. So I've been participating in hearings to basically deal with the exact questions that you're describing at a senior governmental level to say, do we want this to be something where the utility manages the whole thing, including putting the thermostats in the home, or is this really Google and Microsoft's job and we have to find a way for the utility industry to handshake with them? Uh, so it's, it's hard and risky to start a business on that right now, but it's a really uh, key point in time to be thinking about those issues that are very current issues. A closer to home answer to that though, um, we're metering all of the new buildings now. We meter the electricity, the steam, the chill water, the water, the irrigation water, and we submeter the electricity so that we know we're all what's called the feeder breakers. Typically there's one or two feeder breakers for lighting, one for the fans, one for so that way we get a little a much better look at a pie chart of where the energy goes in the building. The metering is made by a variety of companies. Electric metering by one, steam by another, chill water by another. Um, the data collection system, the Pi system that Nick referred to, was made by another company. The, the Modbus connection or Ethernet connection, whatever it happens to be, is yet another thing. We've talked to each of the participants in that sort of food chain and said to them, we would see value in you taking responsibility for this whole thing from the beginning, installing the metering, installing the networking, and giving us this kind of a report at the end. None of them have any interest in it, nor do I think they actually understand what it is we're talking about, despite the fact that they're in a piece of that business. So, you know, is there some opportunity there? From my perspective, yes, there is. One thing to add to that, I think a big uncertainty is residential buildings. I've, I've heard rumors that cable companies are interested in getting into this kind of business of performance feedback uh, of energy consumption in buildings. They have people that, that can go out there, that can install devices, they have a networked box that can, they can communicate with and create displays. So, you know, I, I think there's a, a a lot of uncertainty about where it's going to go and a lot of uh, potential players. Let me just add that this question is central to the research that we're doing here at Sloan and also our curriculum in the S-Lab class. And it's a period of intense experimentation and ferment now, perhaps like the auto industry in, in 1890, where we have not yet created the standards. There's no dominant design. There's going to be a lot of experiments, many of which will ultimately fail. But there's already a lot of exciting startups that are coming out of MIT and other places, GridLogix, Ember, and a variety of others that are making, uh, making their way and finding the business models that are needed to do this along with the technology. You had a question back there. Uh, oh, I was just actually going to comment on the financing. Some work on that um, on the residential side, uh, providing a pay as you save program whereby the utility provides financing for measures and the customers pay back those for those measures on their utility bill each month. So that's just one of the ways. Uh, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, right there. Um, what about co uh, community awareness? I mean, I know Nick touched on this a little bit, but how important is the human factor in all of this? I mean, technology is great, amazing, but. Is there also room for improvement with, uh, with the human factor with uh, awareness? Let me, let me address that, and I think this gentleman in the front here asked a related question uh, earlier. Um, I talked about occupancy sensors, but uh, what I didn't talk about is uh, the benefits of just motivating people to turn off the lights, for example, when we're talking about lights. Um, one thing that was done through the, uh, in, in the, chemistry department about now close to two years ago uh, through the initiative of the administrative uh, officer in chemistry at that time uh, is we had the ability to monitor the sash position of all of the fume hoods. The fume hoods are all variable volume hoods so we have to know the sash position in order to get the airflow and air balance in the room correct. So that information was already being gathered. 
And uh, Mark knew that. So what he suggested, this is Mark Jones I'm talking about, he suggested that we generate a report for each principal investigator showing the average fume hood sash position in, uh, for all the fume hoods in his group. And then the PIs would sort of compare how groups were doing. A very significant reduction in airflow resulted from that when people actually got feedback on how they were performing. They did a lot better job of closing the sash and reducing the sash height when they could. Uh, no investment made other than a little bit of money to, to create uh, the program that actually analyzed uh, the data and, and created a, an Excel spreadsheet dump at the end of the month. Very low cost, very successful. A quick anecdote from Kent Larson's research was that they gave uh, some consumers a, a daily energy bill rather than a monthly energy bill, and they used more than 10% less. So there's a lot of things we need to learn about what are the right cues to modulate our usage around price. There's, there's actually a, a quite a bit of research about how occupants change their behavior when they, get, when they start getting energy feedback. And uh, I think Berkeley Center for Built Environment has a number of papers on the impact. Um, there's some, some work coming out of Oberlin. Uh, they had an electricity dorm competition there where they had uh, feedback to dorm users, and they've turned those into studies about how performance feedback affects uh, the dorm energy consumption. Um, so uh, increasingly, uh, there, there's some research suggesting that it does have an impact when people know more about how they consume and then they change the way they behave. Last question. Go ahead. Uh, actually, I was just commenting on what the gentleman asked about the business model. There's already companies that actually offer the kind of integration that you mentioned. One example is a company called Site Controls that provides this whole integration package with a uh, interface to demand response to the utilities for organizations like Stop and Shop and Shaw so that they can actually save money across their various sites. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, Yost, is it quick? Yeah. Go ahead. So I'm inspired to hear these specific examples that you shared with us, both of research and of experiments with facilities. And I really want to walk the talk, but not only in these focused particular examples and in these new lead buildings, but I want to walk the talk in a lead campus. I want the whole place to be a living lab for what the rest of the planet can and should do. What can we do as students, as staff, and so forth to help you all make this happen and us make this happen? What, what, what are those tips, advice, campaign, movement? Raising a couple hundred million dollars? <laughs> <laughs> well, that wouldn't hurt. I, to start with, I mean, if you, if you can do that. Uh, I'll just give my perspective, and I think uh, there'll, be, there'll be different ones here. Um, it's important. Um, the administration has lots of priorities and lots of pressures and lots of demands for money. So there's, there's obviously a, a very skillful balancing act that has to go on almost on a daily basis there. But uh, that said, if... The, the extent and the level of, of interest and concern in the problem that's expressed by students, by faculty, and by employees is better known to the administration. It helps them to ev better evaluate some of the options that they have, and it, it increases the chance that we're going to get money for some of the things that we've talked about. So some uh, nicely, calmly expressed uh, a statement of interest uh, on a on a wide scale it would not hurt. Uh, go I'll add to that. Or yeah. Nick, go ahead. Well, is the panel? Can I make go a ahead, question? Steve. Please, <laughs> Steve Lanier, go ahead. Um, the alumni aspect. It's been interesting in the past year or so. Uh, a specific alumni interest in funding some of these high return investments has. Uh, uh, has, has raised its head. So there have been some select individuals who would like to contribute money because it can have uh, a multiplicative impact. And so t tapping into the alumni network with both a compelling message and the support behind it to make them believe that it's true and can happen, I think is key. And I think it's something that we haven't done uh, a terrific job, a formal job, of, of doing the outreach to the alumni. Uh, but we do now have a, uh, a nifty little uh, four-pager targeting alumni that we'd be happy to share with people uh, as they uh, go about interface with alumni. So I think alumni is an important one, both as a source of funding, but also articulating uh, its importance to them um, that they see their institute do and act a certain way. 
Amanda. If I could make a quick comment, just um, uh, uh, the, the whole point of Energy Futures Week um, here at MIT that during this IAP was really to bring all of our um, uh, respective creativity, talents, intelligence to bear on the problem. And I think that Steve is sort of soft peddling some of his involvement, um, has been uh, has been very closely um, involved with um, a rally we had on, on Monday about this topic, a very successful workshop <coughs> included just before this one started on doing our own part and walking our own talk. And I think that if, if the messages that we heard here didn't emphasize how those things can pile up, um, then, then um, uh, well, I, I think they did. So I'd really encourage you all to consider um, being more aware of the Greening MIT effort that's on the front page of the tech today um, and the uh, activities that we can all do individually. And if you want to learn more, we've got people here that you can talk to about that. <coughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead, Fine. Harvey, please. And then uh, this is sort of a reiteration of what I said earlier. I think there's a huge opportunity for MIT as well as America to to grab leadership. And I think part of what the student body needs to do is, is help articulate that and take these things in perspective. And there's, there's, there's all the things that Walt has in queue, and I would, I would say we need to do those. Those are all low-hanging fruit. But then what do we do? What I would think is that MIT would want to find a way to do those things and then press forward to create new low-hanging fruit and show a model that really surpasses what's done elsewhere. And to the extent that more of us are articulating that, I think it'll create a more of a reality to it. Great. Well, uh, before I ask you to thank our panel, let me try to quickly summarize uh, the key themes that, that came out today, or I hope came out. And I think you should think about this in terms of the myths that are out there that you will hear from skeptics, from naysayers, and others. Uh, the first myth is that efficiency can't work because what we need is more energy. That's fundamentally wrong. Nobody needs joules. What we need is, uh, as Amory Lovins famously said, cold beer and hot showers, except in the UK where it's the other way around. Uh, it's these services that energy affords that we need, and the least cost way to provide those services, the comfort, the mobility, the communication, et cetera, that's the right economically correct way to do things, and efficiency is all about that. The second myth is that efficiency is sacrifice. Harvey talked about this. Uh, that's just not, not correct at all. Uh, you saw with the steam trap data that not only are we saving energy now by doing that, but it's more comfortable for the building occupants. Uh, the third myth is that efficiency is not cost effective. You've seen these payback times uh, with nothing special about the technology ranging between uh, faster than a year to two and a half years. Well, that's, uh, those are projects with positive return on investment, positive net present value. It's not only that they're cheap, they put money in our pocket right now today, and it's fiduciary irresponsible not to do them. And by the way, those returns on investment beat the heck out of MIT's endowment, even in a good year. Uh, the fourth myth, and, and at every other institution too, the fourth myth is that efficiency is not exciting. Well, with some of the new technologies that you've heard about today, uh, I think you can see that it's uh, among the most technologically interesting activities that we can engage in. And it's, in fact, in attracting some of the best and brightest that we have around here. Uh, when you really do the work, what you find is that efficiency is the fastest, cheapest, most widely available uh, source of energy that we've got today, and it's significantly underutilized. There's a tremendous constituency here on the campus now for, uh, for engagement with this issue. And to just reinforce uh, Yost's question and what you heard over here, uh, as students, you can participate in that by letting the administration know that you care about this. You can get involved in sustainability at MIT. Look it up on the web. You can come to the generator event February 19th. How do they find out about it, Jason? MIT generator. Uh, and as either students, future alumni, current alumni, or other friends of the institute, you can, to the extent you're inclined to donate to the institute, direct that your gift be used specifically for this purpose. With that, let me ask you to thank our panelists for, your, uh, part, for their participation. And uh, I hope you all can stick around for some conversation afterwards. Thank you all very much.